Hi there fellow teachers and students, I'm Professor Brian Ives Araneta and in the first video of this series, I'll begin of course with a sort of a bird's eye view of plant biology as a discipline and uh, probably some logical reasons why we need to study plants. I have been teaching botany in a local college for almost seven years already but I was never really a plant guy. It was only the need for a healthier diet that I began to grow real interest in plants. And then I have this mentor in graduate school who owns a vast collection of plant specimens. His house was almost covered with it. I also have a former colleague who is a strong advocate of organic farming and is integrating growing plants in her lessons. She also encourages people to shift to organic diet as you can see in this picture. Your study of botany must not be grounded only on academic obligation because seriously, our only chance to survive in the future are plants. 90 to 95 percent of the total biomass of all living organisms in this planet are plants. And they range from the microscopic algae to trees and they serve as the primary carbon dioxide sinks released from burned petroleum. Plants are also being extracted for biofuels. They provide raw food to all other organisms and a good deal of plant material is being processed daily and sold in stores for human consumption. Bioactive compounds in plants that have a potential pharmaceutical value have also been researched extensively as well as making plants as models in the design of future green technologies that are environment friendly. Botany, plant biology or phytology is the science of plant life. It was derived from these three Greek words. Long ago, people's interest in plants was mostly centered on how they provide food, fuel, and medicine. But eventually, however, later thinkers became curious about how plants reproduced and how they were put together, leading to its development into a science. There was a good documentary video on the history of botany by BBC, and there you will meet these personalities. John Ray, who deserves enough recognition as one of the forerunners of the science, the ever-famous Carl Linnaeus, known primarily for his binomial classification system. Then Thomas Fairchild and his work on plant hybrids. Charles Darwin is also a certified plant lover, aside from his phenomenal work on the evolutionary theory. You check out this documentary series. You will also find there Jan van Helmont, Jan Ingenhaus, and their collective investigation of plant growth and photosynthesis. Julius von Sachs, whose brilliant accomplishments on plants can be at par with Darwin's work. And of course, Andrew Benson on elucidating the C3 cycle of photosynthesis. There are plenty of scientists who contributed to this science, and I can place all of them here, so the rest is up to you. Next, I'll be presenting the branches of botany. Plant anatomy or phytotomy looks at the internal structure of plants at the cellular level, and it often involves the uh, sectioning of tissues and microscopy. On the other hand, plant physiology complements plant anatomy by investigating how the various structural units in the plants work. This does focus on biochemical processes where organic chemistry and biochemistry is greatly required. Ethnobotany is a cross between cultures and the practical uses of plants in a particular region. An ethnobotanist thus strives to document the local customs involving the practical uses of local flora for the many aspects of human life. Mycology. This is a discipline that was historically under botany but it has non-plant subjects. And in this case, it's uh, fungi. Because it was only a few decades ago when fungi was known to be more closely related to animals than plants. You may consider this a unique field but there is a botany subdiscipline that focuses on plant diseases caused by fungi. And it's called phytopathology. Okay, agronomy. This sounds like agriculture, right? It's the science and technology of producing and using plants for food, fuel, and fiber, and also land management. Uh, agronomists are involved with producing and creating healthier food, managing the environmental impact of agriculture, and extracting energy from plants. Phycology, as the name implies, it deals with uh, algae. These plant organisms are unique because they are the major producers in aquatic ecosystems like rivers and oceans. Thus, their role in the energy transfer in the food web is vital to all life on Earth. Ecology also includes the study of prokaryotic forms known as blue-green algae or cyanobacteria. A number of microscopic algae also occur as symbionts in lichens. Plant systematics is a science that includes and encompasses traditional taxonomy because it doesn't only name, classify, or identify unique plant species. Its primary goal is to reconstruct the uh, evolutionary history of plant life. Plant biotechnology has its roots in genetic engineering and the various techniques established in molecular genetics, uh, genomics, and other molecular-based systems are used to transform plants to be able to use them to meet the needs of humanity or to provide opportunities that enhance economic stability. 
So here it deals with the manipulation of plants with valuable genetic traits for the betterment of the society in the future. Plant ecology studies the distribution and abundance of plants, the effects of environmental factors on plants, and the interactions between plants and other organisms. In the Philippines, one may study, for example, the distribution of trees on uh, the sides of the mountains to be able to assess the uh, potential of a landslide. Or one may look at the impacts of climate change on uh, rice production or any other plant commodity that has an economic importance. Paleobotany looks at plant fossils because they can tell us about uh, prehistoric ecosystems and how plants in those periods influenced life on Earth. It can also tell something about the evolution of plants from aquatic to uh, terrestrial ecosystems. Well, there's supposed to be more, but uh, these are just enough for the overview. So if you're quite interested, you must start somewhere else, and I hope you have already one of these in mind. Plants are organisms, living things that can be single-celled like the blue-green algae. But mostly they are multicellular and their most distinguishing feature is that they can perform photosynthesis, where light energy from the sun is converted to chemical bonds in sugar molecules. This also implies that they have the green photosynthetic pigment chlorophyll, apart from uh, the other complementary pigments they possess. I'll be showing you representatives of the common groups. This is a microscopic unicellular photosynthetic algae that are basically aquatic in origin. And then we have the bryophytes or the non-vascular plants. They keep their structure small so that water and mineral transport is not affected. These are the cone-bearing plants, the conifers, the cycads, the ferns belong to this group. And the most abundant of course are the flowering plants as shown here. It bears fruit which was of course derived from the ovary of a flower. Highly specialized plants generally have uh, roots, stems, and leaves, and of course flowers, fruits, and seeds in the case of flowering plants. We will study them in future lecture video sessions. As living organisms, plants share common characteristics with animals. First, they grow. Growth can mean an increase in size as shown in this time lapse of a growing plant, or an increase in number in the case of uh, microscopic unicellular organisms such as an algal culture shown here where size is hard to differentiate but the increasing density of the green color indicates an increase in the number of these organisms. Plants are also composed of organized units and work in an organized environment. There is a structural organization at least at the organism level from cells to tissues and of course from organs to systems and eventually the entire organism. This represents the increasing level of complexity starting with unicellular forms. Plants have the ability to absorb energy to build chemical bonds and at the same time break these bonds to release energy stored in them. The sum total of all these chemical processes occurring inside the plant body at the cellular level is called metabolism. As organisms, plants should be working units, right? And uh, I can recall my grade school teacher telling me that energy is needed to do work. Energy here is represented by ATP and uh, metabolism is centered on both using and producing ATP to keep the organism working. So anabolism are biochemical processes that absorb energy to build complex molecules while catabolism breaks chemical bonds to release this energy. Plants also respond to stimuli. A stimulus is an environmental signal which can be threatening or favorable to the plant. Chemical or physical signals originating within or outside the plant can trigger it to react in some way. These environmental signals are being perceived by receptors. That means uh, plants have molecules that can sense danger. And this trigger a response. This also allows plants to adapt to their environment and again, these responses are not only for defense but also towards other forms of advantage. I know you're all familiar with, the, with carnivorous plants such as this Venus flytrap. They respond when prey is caught. And finally, plants reproduce. So there is a saying, life must go on. Living things die but the offspring will continue it. Soon you will be learning in detail two modes of reproduction in plants, the asexual and the sexual type of reproduction. But for now, I'm contented to show you this banana shoot here originating from the uh, parent via budding and it's a form of asexual reproduction. Take note that this is sometimes referred to as cloning because the offspring has exactly the same genotype or shall we say characteristics of the parent, meaning these young banana plants here are clones. On the other hand, sexual reproduction in the case of this mango plant here requires the fusion of gametes from male and female parents and the offspring being produced is a hybrid. After the eggs in the ovaries are fertilized, they become fruits and the seeds represent the offspring that will grow into a new organism. So uh, that's it. I hope that I have at least introduced you to your journey on plant science. I will be here to guide you in this series of lecture videos to come and please subscribe to my channel to be updated with every new lecture video uploads. Thank you very much for watching.